Camacho, Susie Slattery, and uh, Stuart Perkoff are on deck and would like to Who? talk to you. Stuart Perkoff. And they're going to talk to you, so folks, you can please and meet Groucho Marx. Well, welcome to your bachelor. I say to say good and divide uh, an extra hundred dollars. <laughs> uh, which one of you is, is uh, uh, Stuart Faco? Is that you? No. No, I'll, I'll have to admit to that. That's me. Oh, you. Yeah. Well, are you two planning on getting married immediately? Uh, where are you from, Susie? Well, I was born in Hollywood. And I lived in Beverly Hills when I was little, and then I moved to the San Fernando Valley. No. Where's your hometown, Shorty? St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Mo, isn't it? Mo, yeah. Is that what you, said? yeah. you know, you have a very interesting mustache. Do you have any special reason for wearing it? Well, it's just vanity. I think I look good with it. <laughs> <laughs> so does a walrus. Why do you shave your scalp? It's much more comfortable. Are you uh, what is loosely called a beatnik? No, I'm, I'm not. Are you a loving cop? No, I'm a poet and a painter and sculptor. Oh. In other words, you're out of work? That's right. <laughs> self-employed, you might call it self-employed. Self-employed, out of work, huh? That's right. Susie, doesn't he look like a beatnik to you? Well, kind of, except he doesn't have a beard. Stuart, if you're not a beatnik, uh, would you tell me, what is a beatnik? Well, I think a beatnik is a person who lives a certain way and believes certain things. The, the way of life implies uh, getting along on a minimum of money and, and a belief in people's ability to work out their own problems without external coercion, do more or less what they want if they don't harm anyone. You, uh, do you believe in this philosophy? Yes, I guess I do, yes. But you're not a beatnik? No, I'm not. Well, how do you differ from a beatnik? I work. You didn't say you were out of work. Well, I uh, work all the time, writing, painting. It's hard work, even if there's not much money in it. when they discovered jazz. Oh, yes, we were the yeah, heroes. Yeah. The heroes. You know, it was a funny thing in our heads that we knew, sort of subconsciously. But we, that was a big power play. I mean, wherever we went, everybody was surrounding us as, with, like, movie stars. And by the time it was over, it was all across America and all across Western Europe and into even a bit of Poland, Yugoslavia, and so forth, country, including the Soviet Union. We were the first group who understood what the media, i.e. TV, could do for us, and the press. And we used it. We were all consciously using it all the time. And no one ever would admit it out loud, my God, that we were manipulating the entire American press. But down underneath every one of us was the one who wanted to be Marilyn Monroe. Beaver told me she wanted to be Marilyn Monroe. Uh, Alan wanted to be Robert Frost. You know, I would like to be Martha Graham. We all had these images that were really conservative from 20 years back, right? And so we were covering it all up by being, quote, cool. I am a Jewish scientist. A document with false statements in it. I will not sign and agree that's true. I don't, that you are, you're not fooling anyone. You're not fooling anyone. You're not fooling anyone. I have offered to go before any committee, do anything you ask. If I can just get you to come down here and take the oath so we can get the answers to some questions. Now, you're, not, you're not fooling anyone at all. Senator, I'm sure that. Senator, let me tell you something. The chair believes that uh, we are American understand. people have had a look at you for six weeks. You're not fooling anyone either. Because you've got to realize that America was at that time in a state of fear in the McCarthy era. And they stopped dead, just like in the 70s, people stopped dead after Watergate. So this is the era of McCarthy. And as a result, the political left was in shambles. And everybody used to say, well, where do you get the young people? Why aren't they doing something? You know, what, what, are they going to let McCarthy do them in? And the answer to McCarthyism was the beat approach, the cool way the black guy handled it. 
right? And in that silence, it was uh, the Beats who picked up on black jazz, drugs, and poetry and art, who made it a fun world. Again, a world that one would want to live in. What the Beats, quote, were taking everything from was where the blacks were at. Because if they could analyze the following, the black oppression, how interesting that it, it, that it produced such extraordinary people, so gifted with some, such a special flair and, and style that whatever was worn in Harlem, three years later would be worn in uh, Oklahoma. Taking cues from the black people by a bunch of white intellectuals, maybe they didn't get it at all exactly straight. I mean, they put in their own little distortions, you know, and, and a marriage is made. Meaning, we had a large population of what in the 60s suddenly became overwhelming, which was middle class people who could not respect the middle class values and were looking for something else. And uh, in New York, this, one of the places you look for it, almost classically, has been Harlem. That was true in the 20s. Um, maybe the artist looks to the oppressed because they identify more closely with that group and then they start to emulate it. The dog, the dog trots freely in the street and sees reality and the things he sees are bigger than himself and the things he sees are his reality drunks in doorways moons on trees the dog trots freely through the street and the things he sees are smaller than himself fish on newsprint ants in holes chickens in chinatown windows their heads a block away the dog trots freely in the street, and the things he smells smell something like himself. The dog trots freely in the street, past puddles and babies, cats and cigars, pool rooms and policemen. He doesn't hate cops. He merely has no use for them. And he goes past them and past the dead cows hung up whole in front of the San Francisco meat market. He would rather eat a tender cow than a tough policeman, though either might do. And he goes past the Romeo Ravioli factory and past Coit's Tower and past Congressman Doyle of the Un-American Committee. He's afraid of Coit's Tower, but he's not afraid of Congressman Doyle, although what he hears is very discouraging, very depressing, very absurd to a sad young dog like himself to a serious dog like himself. But he has his own free world to live in, his own fleas to eat. He will not be muzzled. Congressman Doyle is just another fire hydrant to him. The dog trots freely in the street and has his own dog's life to live and to think about and to reflect upon, touching and tasting and testing everything, investigating everything without the benefit of perjury, a real realist with a real tale to tell and a real tale to tell it with. A real live barking democratic dog engaged in real free enterprise with something to say about ontology, something to say about reality and how to see it and how to hear it with his head cocked sideways at street corners as if he is always just about to have his picture taken for Victor Records listening for his master's voice and looking like a living question mark into the great gramophone of puzzling existence with its wondrous hollow horn, which always seems just about to spout forth some victorious answer to everything. <laughs>
where I was brought up, we were sort of small town royalty. <clears throat> and one of the richest families in both towns, the summer town and the winter town. And we would drive these Cadillac and Packard limousines to school. And there's all, there was always a terrific security in knowing that your father had all this money. The first person who made me realize that I it was even brought up the class question that there was such a thing as a middle class and that I was part of it was our art history teacher at Marymount, Ed Kelly, who would sneeringly talk about you girls and your fathers with their Cadillacs pulling up to the door to let you off. And the other girls in the class were so angry at Ed and said, you know, how dare we criticize our fathers. But Ed also was so passionate about art and painting and just art, period, that it, I, I, I got equally as passionate. And then there was a nun, there was a nun, mother of, I can't remember her name, she was thin and very pretty, and she was an artist, and she used to warn us, saying, girls, if you get too involved with art, religion will go. It's either art or religion. So we tried to follow the um, middle road and not get too passionate about our painting. I guess I believed what the nuns taught, you know? I believed them when they talked about truth and Jesus Christ, and I swallowed it all, but no one else was swallowing it. I would pray every night that I could be a saint. <laughs> the Bohemian lifestyle, similar to the things that you believe? Oh, yeah, exactly. It was like Jesus Christ, you know, coming back to life. It was, you know, there were people who were obsessed with getting at the heart of things. And there I found this community of people who lived that way, you know, who lived in cold water lofts and, and uh, didn't care what the furniture looked like and lived uh, out of the Salvation Army so they could do their work. stillness, yet is not precisely. In short, is not a knot of negation, tangled in tongues of shoelaces of spaghetti. In long under, the image I was wearing out, we were weaning each other by winks of eternity. Still do, butterfly lashes, Indigo. Miss Mechichka, Vnutri Tela O Chromnogo, Ktazvana Yetka O Chromnaka Smech, Na Pravo Smechichka, Iba Mechari et Ot Echi Itundri, Takpe Sash Hotia, Pravo Esha Smechichka, Kope Kami. Akimbami va holos diet dvu. Kruzhaya tsigankami. Vidiete? We are the little laughter within the big body, which sounds like big laugh, but really is little laughter, because we are mountains with echoes and tundras. Thus, the landscape, though really it is still the little laugh, like a kopeck akimbo in the gullet of childhood, whirling like a gypsy. See?
lot of people um, had no label for what they felt. Probably a lot of it was rebelling against the, the Christian ethic, too, you know. It was breaking old patterns of Puritanism, which went with the Christian ethic. And just simply sitting and being, which turned out later to be Buddhism and Zen and all this stuff. I don't know, it happens between eras, I think. Uh, viewpoints change radically. Why it ends is because the, the people's consciousness has been implanted by the new thought. And it's already part of living, so no longer does it cause a big upheaval. It's daily life. What we had to fight for, you take for granted. And so on. It'll go forever. It's like uh, the subconscious begins to see visions and um, it becomes more real than the conscious. So it's a very internal kind of change. People don't even realize it's going on and the sensitive people, the artists, express it. Small burnt offering on the Buddha's birthday. The master sits apart, his nostrils barely breathe this earth. His countenance is brilliant as he touches heaven with his soul. And I pass by, bearing my love like a hair shirt, my eyes breaking at the sight of him, that we cannot partake of the God that dwells so close, that we cannot seize the heaven that lies so near, that we cannot surrender the love that pours so bountifully my hand in yours is like a cold stone on a funeral gas that you should warm me so I may live again. Apart from all the masters...